We're at the Nishikigoi Nosato Museum in Ojio, Japan. I think I got that right, actually. This is the heart of where it all started. We're gonna walk around and see some of the beautiful, amazing koi ponds here, Japanese style gardens. One of my favorite type of landscape is Japanese landscapes because of the way they put so much thought into rock placement. It all kind of means something, the way it faces, even the house means something. And then of course, just the structure of these rocks. They are just probably the most amazing rocks I've probably ever seen in my life. And I know it's a koi museum, but I am a rock guy. I love landscapes, I love waterfalls, I love the structure of a pond, so I'm really focused in on that, but we're gonna learn about the origin of koi and why it's such a huge part of this area here in Japan. I feel like nobody uses ground cover better than Japanese uh, landscape design. This is awesome, you've got something, it's like a moss type structure, it probably actually is a moss. And there are some sedge grass mixed into it. And then just check out how important the structure of the rocks is. All those striations in there, the way the rock is molded, it almost looks like it was a volcanic type rock. So it might be a basalt, looks very dense, but the way that it's structured into the landscape with things in the background and the foreground, and just two, three rocks in here just makes it feel so amazing. And again, the way they have plants coming down around the side, then you're surrounded by this bamboo, gorgeous. Let's walk inside. Of course, first thing you see when you're crossing over is a stream flowing through both sides of the bridge. We got some water moving here, and I can tell you there is something spectacular over through there. We'll get to that in a little bit. So this is, uh, they call this Nishikigoi no Sato, which is the Nishikigoi Museum in Ojia City, um, which is part of Niigata Prefecture. Um, now, they built this to appreciate the industry um, in Ojia, especially in Nagoka, they have um, all the houses, they have koi on them. I mean, we'll even go past later, they've got like the subway, uh, like the underground, you walk through a koi's mouth. So they really do appreciate the industry in this area. So, you know, the government, they realize how much money it produces for the area and how many people it employs. So they built this museum. Um, many years ago now, a long, long time ago, and it, it really got um, quite damaged by the earthquake, but now they've rebuilt it and they've modernized it again. Um, but yeah, it's a fantastic place and it's a fantastic thing for the community in, in general in Japan, um, in the Koi area. This is an example here, Jin Rin Showa. A Jin Rin is gonna be something that has those shiny scales on it almost like it's glistening in the water. And then Showa is gonna be a fish that would have red and white markings on black skin. So you can see where they kind of get some of these names from. And then it just goes, I mean, forever. There's probably about like 50 different names of fish. And it all has to do with how the coloration lays out. some really gigantic fish here. Some of the things people love so much about koi is how friendly they are. They can be trained to eat right out of your hand and they're meant to be viewed from the top. That's why you see all these patterns laid out on the top of their bodies. We got some monsters in here. These are huge fish. And what's so cool is they're so docile. You can really appreciate all different colors, shapes, living aquatic art. Wow, we've got just a fantastic set of waterfalls right out through the windows of the museum. And here we have traditional style Japanese landscape with pond. What I like so much about this style of garden water feature is the edging. You've just got a couple key rocks out around the outside with a very clean landscape around it. A concrete post that are mimicked to look like wood. And then you've got these gigantic statement piece boulders, which are set up as stepping stones through the landscape. And then you've got some really awesome architecture with the walking paths. Just keeping it simple, going through the landscape, surrounded by almost like a marshland around it, leading you over to what could be a meditation spot. Just a couple boulders in the landscape, super clean, just gorgeous.
is something I absolutely love. It's something that really inspires me with the stuff that we do is having rocks all the way at the bottom of the pond, just coming out a good three, four feet from the surface of the water, giving this so much reality, so much structure, just one piece of boulder. That boulder there is probably every bit of like 10 tons. It's just an enormous rock. And this is very much along the style of what we do, these type of waterfalls and streams. The structure of the plants surrounding it, you've got some nice conifers hanging over. They love to use specimen plants here just to appreciate little pieces throughout the garden. And again, followed up by all that underplanting. Just looks gorgeous. My favorite part of this type of a landscape, I think, is the integration of everything together. So you look around, it is very soothing. So you have nice walkways and pathways going through. And then they, they have these massive boulders. Tons of character, very, uh, very specifically positioned um, to, for representation of the local mountains and areas around this incredible area. Then they also come in with all the different amazing plant work. So I think the combination of all these different factors is really what makes this, this style kind of stand out above everything else out there. And I love getting inspiration from it because they've been doing it here for so long. So we could always learn. Um, I'm a perpetual student. I love getting ideas from nature as well as some of the masters that have created this incredible piece right here. across the bridge. This thing is just incredible. The whole garden space here, everything just feels old and it's in place and scale. We don't talk about scale enough. I think people often will tell me like, we need a bridge in our water feature. And I'm like, eh, it's gotta be the scale. This thing just so fits in here. It leads you from place to place. And every time I walk through here, I gotta stop. I gotta appreciate the fish. And the way the rocks tie together with the plant material in here, it is so zen. I was talking to Ralph a minute ago, like, right? How cliche, it's so zen. But this place just, it literally just feels good to be out here. The sound of the water, the movement of the fish, everything's just balanced. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. John hit it on the head when it comes to actually fitting the landscape with bridges. This is a very stretched out garden and there's multiple places to cross the water. And these bridges make sense because you've got such a, a large scale of property to cover. When you try to incorporate something like that into a small backyard, it can be quite overpowering if there's not some context to the landscape. And that comes in the form of layering and actual scale and size. This is something we just love to do is create crossings with just boulders. It's not very formal looking, but the importance of the texture of the rock is key here. And then out here, we've got this awesome Japanese lantern perched upon that rock looks incredible. Definitely something we do quite a bit is this riprap beaches. So going from aquatic up to terrestrial, sloping out with that small cobble work, a couple key boulders planted in the landscape, just looks incredible. And if you notice on the backside here, you've got this gigantic wall and waterfall structure, but honestly, all you see is plants around the bottom. Boulder poking out just a little bit right there but most of it is texture, greenery, color with some of these other plants mixed in just enough to make it feel, as John said, zen-like. Taking this back home with us is gonna be such a, a treat because we're getting to see where this all originated from, what some of the thought processes are when it comes to uh, designing water features like they do in Japan, the birthplace of water features like this, the birthplace of Koi. I uh, can't help but wanna get home and get started on a project. I have immensely enjoyed my time here in Japan. Thank you so much to Greg Whitstock, the pond guy, for bringing us out here. He puts so much stock in the Aquascape Artists of the Year, and the things he does for us is just incredible. Love that guy. Hit that subscribe button, come on back. We are here creating beautiful water features and showing you beautiful water features every week. See you on the next one.